Awesome news everybody, more and more state governments have proposed new stimulus relief. Also new changes have been made and so now Social Security, SSI and SSDI beneficiaries are eligible for received boosted relief benefits. And now here's an update on the latest stimulus proposals. California state lawmakers approved a $300 billion budget this week, but several key sticking points remain between California Governor Gavin Newsom and the lawmakers, which could drag down negotiations on a final spending plan. Under the California law, the governor must sign the spending plan by June 30th, in time for the state's new fiscal year to begin on July 1st. Often many budget details are worked out and approved in the weeks following those constitutional deadlines, which are referred to as budget trailer bills. That appears to be the case once again this year, as top lawmakers and Governor Newsom continue to negotiate over exactly how to spend a historic $98 billion surplus. The budget approved by the legislature early this week includes a record amount of money for public schools and higher education, as well as a total of $40 billion for budgetary reserves. That is nearly the amount in savings before the crisis in 2019. It also includes the $40 billion for infrastructure, projects, and funding to make Medi-Cal available for every low-income resident. Despite the budget's large size, large size, there are still many lawmakers and the governor to work out. Republican Assemblymember Vince Fong said the approved budget fails to address critical crises facing their state. Fong, who is a top Republican on the, on the Assembly Budget Committee, criticized Democrats for passing an incomplete spending plan to meet their deadline and planning to fill in the gaps later. Other resolved issues include rebates to address skyrocketing gas prices and inflation, as well as reimbursement rate increases for state-sponsored childcare, providers, and disability insurance. Another sticking point between top lawmakers and Newsom is the size and eligibility for a tax relief package aimed at helping Californians cope with inflation and record high gas prices. Newsom proposed sending $400 per vehicle up to $800 to car owners to offset the rising cost of fuel. Leaders in the Assembly and State Senate have insisted on targeting tax relief to lower income residents who spend a higher percentage of their income on necessities like housing and transportation and are hit hard by inflation. Lawmakers unveiled their own plan to send $200 per person, with an additional $200 per dependent for individuals earning up to $125,000 for families. And in a statement after the legislature's budget was passed, Newsom's office said the governor would like to see more immediate relief to help millions of more Americans with rising gas prices and rent prices and grocery price increases. They were also noting Newsom's plan would spend about $3.5 billion more on tax relief. Meanwhile, Republicans continue to call Newsom and Democrats who control the legislature to, spend, to suspend the state's gas tax, which is set to increase 50 cents per gallon to 54 on July 1st. Republican state lawmakers argue suspending the gas tax will provide near immediate relief to those impacted by high gas prices. Democrats have refused to cut the gas, signing the funding it provides for infrastructure projects. They also say there's no way to guarantee oil companies and gas stations will not keep prices high and pocket the difference. That being said, Courtney, I understand today's meeting was pretty conciliatory, pretty workmanlike. They tried to dial down the tensions. The one thing that emerged, though, that ought to be a concern, I think, for anybody thinking about oil prices longer term, is whether the administration is thinking of restricting the export of petroleum products like gasoline and, and diesel. That would be an authentic mistake. And I understood that came up in the meeting and some folks uh, left that thinking that could be really on the table. Hmm. Let me, let me ask a couple of questions here, because there's, there's all this talk about, uh, as you said, Court, uh, profit margins are not acceptable. I'm not sure whose profit margins the president is talking about. Is he talking about the big refiners, the, the exploration and production companies? Is he talking about the retailers? What are the profit margins, and how much have they risen here as oil has gone from 50 a barrel to uh, 102 a barrel? You know, he hasn't been clear. The folks that sell us the gasoline and diesel at the pump are small mom and pop businesses. Correct. They don't have a franchise. Well, their profit margins are tiny. They're making most of their money on the chips and soda, not the gasoline. Now, because we have a refinery shortage problem, because we don't have enough refining, we've been shutting down refining, uh, we do have unusually wide spreads between crude oil and the wholesale price of gasoline and diesel. Those are $50 a barrel. Usually that's $15 a barrel. That doesn't reflect gouging by refiners of the oil industry. That reflects the fact that we have enormous pent up demand. We've been destroying and reducing refining capacity uh, and the input costs for refining, natural gas and other things are quite high. So there are free market, you know, understandable reasons why you have these 
these high margins at the refining sector. So it's the refining, it's the margin at the refineries that have that has have widened uh, largely uh, the difference between what the crude costs and what the then wholesale get product is, whether it's gas or diesel or jet fuel. That's where the change has been, and that is a function of lack of supply, lack of refining supply, right? That plus the loss of Russian exports. Remember, Russia was one of the world's largest. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. Um, so happy to be leading the charge with you. Um, and I'm happy to be standing here sandwiched between um, our two electric vehicles. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg and I both have two of the electric vehicles that are in that 600,000 uh, electric vehicle fleet and um, more to come, obviously. So the future is electric. And this administration is moving toward it at lightning speed. So as Gina mentioned, in August, the president and the, the big three automakers stood side by side in the Rose Garden, I think with a number of those who are here, including Congresswoman Dingell, um, to be able to say that they, the private sector is committing that half of their fleet will be electric by 2030 which is um, amazing because, as Gina said, we are really moving in that direction so fast that we may even get there sooner than that. But we're not going to go electric fast enough if we don't have the ability to eliminate range anxiety for people and to be able to have them plug in wherever they live, wherever they work, wherever they want to head. And so today, to make sure that every American can not just purchase an electric vehicle, but use it wherever they go. We're so happy to be able to give guidance to the states across the country about how to access the funding in this, uh, in the announcement today, which is $5 billion and the guidance for states for setting up up to 500,000 electric vehicle charging ports across the country. That $5 billion will be part one of the effort that we are undergoing with the joint office between the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation. This first tranche is really the spine of our transportation system. The preference will be for charging uh, stations along highways and, and transportation corridors. Part two will be in partnership with states and local governments and tribal communities to make sure that this, tr this charging ability is in all communities, particularly in communities that have not had access to charging stations. We want to 